I also, while we're talking about thank yous, I want to thank the society for inviting me to talk about this. And especially, you know, Peter and Yulia and Louise helping me set up earlier today. Um, and I also want to thank FCAT for coming out here all the way up to the hill towns. And I especially want to thank, um, particularly want to thank all of the property owners in Conway who have been really nice and hospitable to let me come and look around and just explore on their property. They've all been very gracious and very welcoming. So I really appreciate that. Um, tonight, you know, my focus is not going to be so much on the hobby of metal detecting and all the ins and outs of that, um, though I will um, make one um, little um, uh, highlight here, which is just this is kind of like our code of conduct, and I think anybody who's going to get into this hobby, I encourage that you really do it responsibly. You don't burn the fingers of landowners by trespassing without permission. You don't leave a place in a mess. You, if you're dealing with um, you know, federal, state, or even county land, you really need to find out whether you can do that. Um, Yulia and I were talking earlier, and she was saying that, unfortunately, state forests around here are kind of off limits for metal detecting. We're hoping that maybe we can get them to change their attitudes to be a little more balanced. But currently, that, that is the situation. And uh, I, I hope, because I don't think, I think there's an equitable balance. And they do this in the UK. They've worked out some really sensible regulations for how they can encourage people in the hobby without trampling on archaeological sites and things of historical importance. But as I, as I said, what really stokes me is it's not so much like a treasure hunting phenomenon, it's finding these curious things, some of which are real mysteries to me, and then finding out what do they tell me? What, what, what is it? You know, what is it rather than what's it worth? And, uh, and I've always had an interest in coin collecting and other little historical odds and ends, and, but I just find the, uh, the really crazy odds of stumbling across some of this stuff gives me quite a kick. And that's probably more than any, it's the finding more than anything else that's the fun rather than whoopee, I just found treasure or, or whatever. And I think that's a misperception that a lot of people have. A lot of people in this hobby are kind of stoked about history in their own ways and they just find something magical and, you know, about holding an object in their hands that just saw the light after two or three hundred years. So anyway, the, the, the subject again is going to be the, the objects, and so I'm going to move on to that, and I'll take you through um, starting really on, on um, is there any chance we could just do the lights down a little bit? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I have to make sure I don't rest anything on this wire here. So starting out on the ground floor, um, something very mundane, and I'm just curious if any of you um, recognize what these are. I was finding them for a while and I was trying to figure out. Yes, that was the thing that it took me a little while to discover, but you know, there's a network of people on the internet because why, what are these half of horseshoes that I'm finding? Oxen shoes. And I find a lot of them. I didn't bring in half the, uh, and a, there's a fair number of gone into metal recycling as well. But, so they're divided in half. I mean, again, for people who actually work with animals, they know this. The oxen hoof is, is, is a split hoof. It's not like a horse, and, and so that was why these shoes were structured this way. And the, I find these way more than I find horseshoes. And in doing some of my research, I learned that this really was because up well into the late 19th century, these really were your main, you know, beast of burden, your, your tractors, your trucks, they did all the hard, heavy lifting. And that's, you know, makes sense why, why they would turn up so often. The next item, again, for those who know animals, they may recognize what these are, but these also turn up quite often. And any, any guesses out there? What's the scale? Um, that's a half inch scale on those grids. Pardon? Ox like that. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. So they do have, some of them have, um, you know, like a hex nut kind of shape on the outside. They usually always have a little side screw. 
their ox knobs for putting on their horns. So they would sometimes put them on the horns and maybe cut the very sharp tip off. And um, I think the best illustration, this is a cow, I believe, excuse me. But, but that gives you the basic idea. And so it would prevent them from injuring themselves, another animal, and certainly not injuring a person. Um, and again, I'm still in, mostly in fields here, and I find quite a few of these. And I was thinking, OK, obviously there are bells, but why am I finding these, so many of these? And then I'll find these, which I thought, OK, maybe these are the bells from old telephones, um, bicycles. And I said, but you know, finding them in the middle of a farm field, and how many telephones would be shedding their bells? <laughs> so you know, again, it's a, it's a, a puzzlement. But then I did a little research. So, there are wagon bells of various kinds. You have big transport going on. You need some way of warning people that this vehicle is coming along. And I guess over time, they break and fall off and end up in the dirt. And 150 years later, I come along. But in that musical, so I find a fair number of these. And I think you probably can recognize what they are. They are indeed. They're known, they could be known as sleigh bells, um, horse bells. Their proper name is crotal bells, which is a weird word, but I, I discovered that it actually comes from, possibly from a Greek word for rattle or bell, a very old Greek word, crotalon. Or also, there is a theory that it comes from a Gaelic word, crotal, that also means a bell or, or um, uh, rattle. So these, again, would have been mostly mounted on to horse by leather straps and in series, and they would make quite that classic jingle bell tune that you would love. So, some of the ones that um, I found have maker's marks on them. And they come in all different sizes. So this one here, um, I looked up, found, finally found out that, as you might imagine, in the early days, and probably, I think these bells probably did, were in use more like the early 19th century rather than the late 18th, but it's possible. But in any case, there wasn't a great deal of manufacturing, as you know, in the colonial period and just shortly thereafter, because um, for a variety of reasons. And these ones on the left were made in England. And the one on the left I've definitely identified as being made sometime between 1755 and 1798. The one on the right is a bit of a puzzle. The only maker I can find that's like this actually dates it from the 1600s which is really cool if it's true. I'm a little suspicious that there might be another WH maker out there that I just have not discovered yet. The ones on the right um, have both a nifty little, oh, I think I have a, a pointer that uh, uh, Louise loaned me. But the one on the right has a little um, kind of a horse logo. You can barely see it on the upper side of the upper bell. But it's. Um, Do you have any of those to um, make sound with us today? Aha! Uh -huh. Well, you anticipate my my performance. So right around there, there's a little, and then the initials W E B are down below. So they're definitely datable to this William Barton's factory down in East Hampton, Connecticut, and the factory ran for quite a long time, but went out of business in 1881 or was sold to another. So that sort of dates them in there. But in answer to your question, one of the other things that I find fun is that if they're intact, if their ringers are intact after all this time, and you clean them out, you get to hear them again after 150 years. So there's one, and and there you go. This little fellow here, <laughs> and, they, and, and then this one's about the size of a of a grape. 
So that, that's, like I said, when you don't have a lot else to keep you entertained, that, <laughs> that, that's fun for me. Is the regular and a metal ball? Yeah, so it's a little steel ball, and you know, sometimes they can corrode away and various other reasons. So it's just a matter of luck whether they've met. Sometimes they freeze against the sides of the uh, chamber as well. But um, as I said, it's, it's fun when you, can, when you can get them to spring to life again. Would these, the size of these, would, would they make a lower sound? Yeah, yeah. And they actually go up as large as a tennis ball. I mean, they, some of them are quite large. I have never found a really, that's the largest one I found is the one on the left there, and it's about the size of a golf ball. Well, a little larger maybe than a golf ball, but anyway, um, I have found fragments of these enormous ones, and uh, I guess they just get subject to getting hit by the plow or something more often. And yeah, what kind of metal are these bells? I think they're a copper alloy. Sometimes they talk about a metal that they might be, some of them might be made of called tombac, which is a copper zinc alloy. Um, but they generally, based on the tarnished colors and sometimes in the way they hold up, they, they appear to be something in that bronze to copper alloy, you know, range. So now this is something else I find a lot. And I'm just, I mean, some people will know what this is right off the bat, but I'm just curious. Any, any guesses? Hmm? Harmonica. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that you, you nailed it. Uh, whoever said harmonica. So, you know, not entirely remarkable to find one or two over years. Um, but, and this is just helps you a little more to figure out what they are. But let's just say I find a lot of these. <laughs> and I find them in fields. So that kind of raised another question in my mind, and why am I finding so many harmonica reeds? And you know, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons there. Um, I did do a little research and discovered that the harmonica came over with the German immigrants kind of around the second half of the 19th century. They might have been here before the Civil War, but a variety of makers in Germany and Matthias Honer, the Honer, name you probably recognize, eventually kind of bought up a lot of companies and he became the largest producer. And he shipped, well, he, he manufactured in 1880 2.1 million harmonicas and 90% of those were sold in the US. And as far as why I'm finding them, I think it's just a testimony to how probably your average working guy would have one in his pocket. They're out there in the fields and they're working away and they take a break and he pulls it out of the pocket, you play, and it just, you know, another little glancing, you know, hint of what life was like back then for the average, average working guy. Um, so now we've moved, I'm gonna move from the, the farming and the ground level to what was going on in terms of your average Conwayans pocket change back then. Mm -hmm. And by back then, I'm really talking about late post-revolutionary and into the early federal period, so sort of like around the 1780s into the, into the, into the um, 1830s, let's say. So I have a few instances of what I'm gonna call pocket spills and that's just a term that we detectorists use when you find several items in the same hole right next to each other and you're pretty sure that they all came out of someone's pocket at the same moment. There's context there. It's the same moment in time. And so we've got all post-revolutionary war, King George III, half pence, King, uh, two of those, and then this other coin that said Octori Connect. And I was like, okay, well, what is that? And um, I did a little research, and you'd find out that it is a coin that State of Connecticut issued, in this case in 1787. So I will go into a little more detail on these. I just wanted to go to another pocket spill uh, in Conway. And um, this one has two coins I found together, an early US large cent, um, very corroded and very worn. Uh, so anywhere from 1796 to 1807, then I found a Spanish coin, silver coin, and um, learned it was, it was a half real, was a denomination, and from 1779, quite worn. 
So both of these lead me to believe that, well, they were not dropped in 1780. Well, they, this, these pennies didn't exist then. So again, pushing it more into the early federal period, the early 1800s. Okay, a um, couple of things come to mind there. Why <laughs> so many different coins? Um, I haven't seen, you know, why not more U.S. coins by now or whatever, but, uh, but you know, hold that thought and we'll come back to it. And then in uh, the Cricket Hill area of town, I found these two together. So the top one is a Massachusetts scent. So I said, okay, and very clearly says Mass. It's very corroded, but it, it, believe me, take it on faith, it does say Massachusetts. And the other one is another one of these Octori Connect. And I'm not sure what date it is, so it's somewhere between 1785, 1788. So all of those jumbled together, all of those closely associated kind of cinched it for me that that was you know, all in flux, all in circulation at the same time. So I'll go to a few key dates here. So the war ends. In 1781, the Articles of Confederation um, come into effect. The Constitution wasn't ratified until 1789 by the last state remaining states. The U.S. Mint wasn't established until 1792 and really didn't get going on anything much until 1793. And even there, production was low, so it took a while. And it wasn't until 1857 that the U.S. actually said that Spanish or other foreign silver and gold were not acceptable as legal tender. Up to that point, they were. So all of this, is, I'm trying to put together a picture that at this time, rather than thinking about everybody operating with one kind of currency in Conway at that time, there were many varieties all changing hands at the same time. I'm sure there was a lot of barter going on and, you know, and, and those kinds of things. But and even when you're working in a healthy barter exchange, you always need to have small change. You always need something. And this, we're really talking about small change here. Bigger amounts would have been you know, held by banks, and also there was a lot of script that was printed by colonies for transactions, but people didn't trust that very much, and its value went up and down wildly. So having good, hard coins in your hand was always welcome, and there was never enough, is my point. So again, um, these were found in town. King George II, by far the most, if I find a King George coin, by far the most common is this coin. And um, a couple of things come to mind, um, one, of, one of which is that there is in, in thanks for our help, Massachusetts help in the French and Indian War, tons of these were shipped over to Massachusetts as payment. So there were a lot of King George II's that came over on that ship. And a lot of them were dated 1749, which happens to be where that one on the upper left corner is from. Which one is, where's your oldest dated coin that you found? I'll actually be coming up to that shortly, really? and I'll show you that. Yeah, <laughs> no, the, so that, that will come. And what are and, these made of mainly? Um, again, mostly copper. If they're genuine, they're gonna be pretty solidly copper. I mean, I don't know if the percentage was 90% or whatever, but uh, and that certainly had an effect on its value and how it was appreciated by people. Um, so anyway, they, 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 they come up and they clearly were floating. And I, again, I've, I have found them contextually with coins from much later, a later date. So they were, they were around. Now these, uh, I've only found, I found less of these, but King George III, who was our monarch when we rebelled, is um, you know, present now and again. And that's a, on, the ones on the right are obviously non-dug, pristine examples, because it's very hard to see exactly what's going on here. And so the other main currency, as far as silver and gold, and believe me, I have never found any gold <laughs> coins. Spanish silver was the most widely accepted, the most um, <laughs> trusted source. And the Spanish dollar, which would be that large one, which is about the size of our silver dollars, if you, any of you have an image of that in your mind, became the model for our dollar. And it was, uh, it was valued at eight reals, and people would make change sometimes with those by just cutting them. 
because they weren't, again, <laughs> they didn't always have small change. Now, I have found some, sorry. You. So that's why the pie shape. Yeah, so those pie shapes were eights, so they were one, one real or one bit. If you cut a quarter, it was two bits. Uh, half was four bits. So I think some of you already know where we're going with this, but you know, the two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar. Yeah. That's, that's the origin of that phrase. It's um, the pieces of eight. By 1830, about 25% of all circulating coins in the US were Spanish origin. And it was so popular, it became the model for a dollar. And um, as I mentioned, it could be cut up into bits. And I have to say, and this is not me talking, that this is the first example of Bitcoin that you are going to find. <laughs> I didn't make that up, but it sounded good, so I, 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 I swiped it. So I've never found an A-Real coin, and if somebody knows where one is and wants to call me up, I'm going, I'm there. What I have found is a couple of these half real. And you can see they're slightly smaller than a dime. They would actually not even be one bit. They would be a half of a bit and equivalent to six cents out of a dollar. This one is the one I mentioned earlier from 1779. And I was fortunate enough to find a two bit coin, which you can see also closely parallels our quarter in size and our two bits in size. It would have been worth 25 cents, and this one is the oldest coin I've ever found, and it was minted in Spain in 1711. How it ended up in Conway, I'll never know, and how it ended up being lost. Uh, this would have been about $5 in the day, and so somebody would have not wanted to lose this. And so, but again, that shows some of the flux that was going on. Now this coin I found in a farm field, and I'm saying, okay, I know King George by well, you know, pretty well by now. You know, what, what exactly is this? And I'm looking at, it says L-U-D-O-V on the left side. And that's about all I can make out. I don't know if anybody knows Latin, but um, this turns out to be a one sol of Louis the 15th. And it's the same size as all the English half pence and actually, you know, the so it probably was considered the same value and used in very much the same way. So I don't know how, I, I know that French coins as you went further south become more common, especially when you get down to Louisiana, you imagine everything else. And I do know of a person who, um, he's not a friend, I just know him from the internet, who found a gold French coin in a field down in somewhere in, the, in one of the southern states. So they were in circulation as well. Um, and it just adds to the, to, the, to the variety that's going on. So with this shortage of, of small change though, people were just crying out for, like I say, this kind of, you know, and some entrepreneurs stepped up to fill, to fill the, uh, yeah. unfortunately they didn't all do it legally. So both in England and America, there was a fair amount of counterfeiting, which you, you know, obviously you underweight the coin or you dilute the, copper purity or whatever. These are two that I've found in Conway and the left one is totally some base metal, pewter, lead, whatever it is, it's junk metal. But it barely can make out the figure of Britannia, the seated Britannia on there, and probably was trying to look like a King George the first halfpenny, but obviously was not worth a darn once the, once the plating wore off. The other one, is supposed to be a King George II. The lettering is very crude. Both sides are, are more crude. It, it's too thick. And to me, it has the feel and impression of being a coin that was cast, which is not how coins were manufactured. They were stamped. So I, I'm fairly certain that both of these are, I know for the fact that the one on the left is counterfeit. I mean, there's no, no way. I have heard someone say, I wouldn't give you two bits for that. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, like I, say, I, I grew up hearing that rhyme, but I guess it's become more and more uh, you know, lost to the past. So there were some more um, legal ways where people tried to make a profit while answering the need for, for small change. So there was a fellow down in, in um, I'll have to check my notes here to make sure, named John Chalmers in Annapolis, Maryland. And he 
proposed to the government of Maryland that they would sort of go in with him to make a number of silver coins based on the British money pattern, three pence, six pence, and shillings. And he was going, he was a silversmith, he was going to mint them in such a way that he would certainly make a profit on that. Maryland eventually said, nah, I don't think we want to put up our money. And he went out on his own. He manufactured this. And I don't know how common they were, but I do. I, I view these all as random samplings. If I find them, they must be random. Uh, I found one of these shillings that he manufactured in very worn condition. I don't know if you can really see the word um, shilling up here. So, and this says Annapolis over there, and then Chalmers uh, very uh, egotistically puts his name down below. Um, and you can see this non-dug you know, non example down there. So that would have been one bit. Uh, it's slightly larger than the dime. It's about the size of a nickel and would have been worth 12 and a half cents in the day. And it would have been worth about 250 now as spending power. Um, and another entrepreneur that tried to answer this was a fellow named um, Robert Morris, who was a superintendent of finance back in the early days. And under the Articles of Confederation, he proposed to the US government that, hey, I could make up a new monetary set for you. And based on the decimal system, which would be an innovation over the British system of pounds, shillings, and pence. And there was a lot of talk it was going to go on, and we were, they were going to do it, and then kind of said, nah, not right now. So he went out and had a bunch manufactured in Birmingham, England, shipped to the States. And again, presumably he made some money on, on, it, on the deal, but it never lasted very long. They only made a few issues. And considering that I found one here, I again assumed that this was part of the mix. So this is a private contractor again, trying to fill the need. And it's a 1783 coin. It's known as a Constellatio Nova. And basically where the, that comes from is there's 13, supposed to be 13 stars there. And this was the new constellation in the world of the 13 colonies. And this is the eye of providence watching over it all. So there's a certain aesthetic charm and poetry to that. And then after a while, under the authority of the Articles of Confederation, and again, there was a lot of counterfeits coins. We must mention that. There was also uh, the feeling that they needed more. So states started to make their own money, mostly with private contractors doing that for them. Uh, Massachusetts funded, or private entrepreneurs, even Massachusetts funded our pennies, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, though we lost, would you be surprised that the state lost money on the deal? It took more to, manuf <laughs> took more to manufacture them than to you got out of it. So these are Connecticut pennies. There are several issues from 1785 to 1788. Um, these ones looking right, these ones looking left. Um, you can see that they, I was fortunate to find these in, in very good shape. They're exactly the same size as the British half pence and would have been considered the same in trade. Do you know whose face? Um, I'm going to arrive. I, I love you. You're so, you're like one step ahead all the way. Um, Massachusetts, again, you saw this one earlier, so I just wanted to give you a picture of something that's a little better to recognize. Um, they made actually a cent and a half cent. Um, and this happens to be a cent, uh, Cricket Hill area of town. But lest we forget, New Jersey. Uh, I, I've only found two of these in all the years I've been looking, and this is the best conditioned one of the two. So it's really hard to make out, but it does say e pluribus unum and has a shield on one side. And I believe this is 1785, but I, or 86, I'm sorry. Um, so, so that was the private contractors. The mint has still not come into being at this point. Now, your question about who is on these coins. So this is where metal detecting veers into psychology a little bit. I mean, we just had a revolution. We just got rid of an oppressive tyrant named King George who has his face over all these coins. Why, oh why, when the states start issuing their coins, do we have the Connecticut 
coins over here with a king, very regal figure with a, um, a laurel wreath looking to the right. There's King George and Britannia. And wait, this isn't Britannia, so who's that? Same thing, another regal looking figure with the wreath here and a very Britannia looking figure. This is the New York penny. This is the second issue of Vermont's penny. I'm, I was kind of you know, wondering about this myself. And my, my thinking, and was borne out by a little research, is that they wanted the coins to be accepted. They wanted it to look like people were used to seeing. And so just an element of psychology that it looked like something they were used to, they would accept it more. And of course, they got around Britannia by putting the slogan of independence and liberty on the backside. But uh, nobody was fooled. It looks a lot like Britannia. So, and I think they were, you know, they were fairly, the Connecticut, by the way, Connecticut made the most, of, uh, they produced the most, and they're the ones that I find the most of. And by the way, usually the ground is not kind to these coins, and so if I find one at all that has detail, it's, it's remarkable. Between the general wetness and chemistry of soil and the use of fertilizers, a lot of these coins get, get wasted. Now, I just wanted to point out that Britain weren't exactly original in their coin designs themselves. So this is the Cistercius of 140 AD, which was used as the model for regal British halfpence. So we, in our own way, are, we're following in a 640-year tradition to use this iconography on, on our coins. So now we're going to get on to, and I can, I can probably hear my wife yawning at this point, buckles and buttons. She's going, oh my lord, are we really going to talk about buttons? Well, I find them interesting to find. And they tell you a lot about the date of a site that you're on. And they tell you a little bit about fashion trends and material culture at the time. So the oldest buttons probably are the ones I find that are made out of pewter and, and kind of lead alloys. They do not hold up very well. They very, become very friable and, and, and break apart in the ground. The other ones that are quite commonly found if you're in an early site that tips into the 18th century is buttons made out of a silvery looking brittle material called tombac, which is an alloy of copper and zinc and possibly some other metals. Um, they hold up pretty well in the ground. They change from a somewhat light goldeny color in their birth to a plain dull um, gray over the, over the decades. So when you find these, uh, you're pretty much sure that you're in the 18th century as far as the context of what else may be around there. I just wanted to show a few. This is a broader span of time, well up into the late 19th century, but it just shows some of the more ornate buttons. The lower ones, uh, the ones with that sort of scribe work might be Tombeck or they might be plated in another substance that's just turned black over time. But you can still see that graceful engraving that they have. How These, were they attached? Uh, pretty much the way we do. Um, you know, that little um, shank on the back, um, oh. you know, a loop, a shank loop. I haven't showed you the backs there, but actually you can see the back of the one there. It's, it's pretty, pretty much the same as, as nowadays. Uh, the shanks often break off. They're often made of steel and don't hold, or iron and don't hold up as well. But um, I don't know if the ones. So the other element of, uh, in this, what I'm going to get to now, is I find some very large buttons. And I'll, just a small smattering of these. So that's a, a US half dollar in the middle. And I think, again, we don't have those much in change anymore. But give you a sense of how large these buttons are. And I don't know if you, about you, but I think they may be a little bit too big. <laughs> So these are known as dandy buttons. And it seems like as a fashion trend, again, starting in England in the late 18th century, the sporting of large, flashy, and these were usually gilt buttons became all the rage, especially if you were distinguishing yourself as slightly higher class. And it just went on from there. They got bigger and bigger, and, and they would be very, as I say, very brightly gilt. You can see a sample of, of a coat. I, I, I gilt a button over there recently to show the effect of it in the case. You can look at that later. And this is a contemporary illustration. 
where, let's just say they, the, 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 the feeling became that the trend was going a bit too far. It was a bit too dandified. And dare I say, might even be, you know, a bit too effeminate or ostentatious, you know, think, thinking in their terms. So these are both, both dandies of, uh, of their day. And I want to point out their shoe buckles because we will come back to that later. Now, another name for dandy was macaroni. <laughs> and as you know, Yankee Doodle went to town riding on his pony, he stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle, dandy. So that is all part of the, it all ties together, folks. These, just to quickly, um, I don't have precise dates on all these. I have come across a few military-related buttons. Um, I don't know exactly. They're, I just haven't been able to get the uh, nail them down in a specific authority. But uh, U.S. militia, an early Massachusetts militia cuff button there with the Native American image, a couple of early Navy buttons that I'm fairly certain are pre-Civil War, and another mass militia button down here. Later than the one above, probably pre-Civil War, though, though it could have run into the Civil War period. Were these all found in Conway, or? Yeah, everything you're seeing tonight was found in Conway. Wow. And this one had me puzzled for a while, and I have no other identification other than it's a Royal Navy captain's button from 1774 to 87. And um, how it got here, I don't know, someone who had served in the British Navy and maybe lived in Conway or settled in Conway, had lost it. And this here, much later in time, but I wanted to show it because it relates to our history of Boston and Maine, button cover. So this was intended to be slipped over a button that was already attached. Um, and the Boston and Maine Railroad, uh, this is marked patent pending, 1886, uh, took over the Conway Street Railway and this was not far from the trackway where I came across this. And I'm thinking it's a cuff size button. It's not very large, but you can see it has that, it actually has a little spring clip in the back and the opening and it would kind of slip over. Uh, it kept tension and would slip over. Now, as far as buckles go, when I'm lucky, I do find a complete shoe buckle. These are very typical normal average guy shoe buckles. And shoe buckles had their moment in time. They, they lasted, they were you know, around for quite a while. They were a good durable way of securing your shoe. They were detachable from the shoe. So if a shoe ever wore out or just got beyond repair, you could move it to another pair of shoes, especially if it was a particularly treasured item. And so these are just typical frames. Usually you just find the frame or you find a piece they call those two inner bits the shape and the tongue, the tongue being that forked. But you can see how that would, those pointy forks were made to fix into the leather. And this is a, a reenactor's picture of partially securing his shoe with a, a more ornate shoe buckle. Um, this is, I listen to those, I found a couple of smaller buckles. The one on the left is definitely what you would call a knee buckle. And those were used again in the late 18th century to secure your, um, you know, you can, you can see that there, but you would secure your hose or your, your leggings. And here he's got some very nice silvery shoe buckles on there as well. And these are some of the somewhat more high status or ornate buckles I have found. Again, you usually just find the pieces. Usually the plows have not been kind. The one down below, I mean, sometimes the outsides were made of a brass alloy, or if you're really lucky, they'd be made out of silver. But the inner workings often were iron, and so they would corrode away, and that's why you lose them. Or the pin that held the inner workings would be iron, and the same reason. But you can see that this was quite an elaborate design. This here also, this one was gilt once upon a time, it would have been beautiful, it would have almost had a jeweled appearance back in its day. And that's a picture of the lower one. And I just wanted to point out that you can see there's a remnant of, of gilding just surviving there in that little lower recessed spot. So 
So they had the height of their fashion, as I said, in the 1770s and 1780s. And some examples can be strikingly large and heavy. Uh, and it, 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 the trend ended up being going larger and more ostentatious. Some of the ones could be as wide as 70, 70 millimeters and cover the full width of the shoe. Um, they got so out of hand that there was, it, it, like the dandy buttons, it became a subject, it was worn by dandies and became a subject of ridicule. And so a, a contemporary, uh, David Garrick, wrote at the time, the buckle then its modest limits knew, now like the ocean dreadful to the view, hath broke its bounds and swallows up the shoe. <laughs> The wearer's foot, like once his fine estate, is almost lost. The encumbrance is so great. <laughs> so the, while I'm on the topic of buckles, the next buckle I'm going to show you is really the, for me, it was one of the luckiest and most remarkable finds um, that I've made. Um, and I will. What are you pointing out in the circle? Oh, there's a little remnant of gilding. So I could see that once upon a time it did actually, it was fully gilt and would have been very brilliant, especially with the twisted, the twisted yeah. formation. So this is silver. It's very small. It's about an inch and an eighth high. It's in the display case over there. Um, and it's known as a witch's heart. So again, I was very curious and interested about this when it, when it came to light. I've never found one of the, I mean, of course I've never found one of these before. And I have heard of a couple of people finding them. So the heart shape, this heart shape is very much characteristic right in that Georgian period, again, mid to late 1700s, early, very early 1800s. And there's plenty of speculation, speculation online as to why it's called a witch's heart. But I'm going to quote some info I got from John and, Jags, John and Jan Mags's antique site where they said that it was believed to protect against the evil eye and keep witches from harming infants, so it might have been affixed to their blankets. But others say that it is a love token and can signify that the giver was bewitched by the wearer. So you can take whatever um, story you like and run with it. I will say it would also could have been used as a shirt buckle. And a men back in those days may not have had any buttons at all on the shirt. It may just have been affixed by a couple of pins. And I will show you a reenactor's uh, garment here. And here's a couple of comparable buckles um, just to show you again, period-wise, where we're talking. So this is in Colonial Williamsburg, and this is um, something that historic New England has in, has in their collection. Um, so this item here is the main endpoint of my, my talk, but what I might go, I want to check my time and not uh, impose too long. I have a few other odd items, and I thought I would toss them out to you to see what, um, what you think. So this part is called, what is it, Dr. So, there's a clue in there for anybody who's sharp-sided, but what are these? Watch winders. Yeah, yeah watch exactly, winders. exactly. They're watch winders. Oh. And I love finding these, and they're, none of them are more than probably about an inch tall. So, to find something that small is, is actually quite... And for the sharp-sided of you, the middle one actually says, Waltham watches. <laughs> so, so, there was a clue there for anybody. Um, sorry? No, this is definitely earlier technology of a large pocket watch that would have the key would insert into. Okay. Now, I always wondered why they called it a Phi Beta, Phi Beta Kappa key, a key, and I didn't realize, oh, it was because it mimicked a watch key. Well, there you go. How far? And by the way, in case you were wondering, yes, some of these turn up, obviously never in working order. <laughs> not, even, not even a Timex, you know, um, by the way. Um, but they do turn up. Um, empty like that often and bereft. Sometimes I find little gears. Um, now, I wonder if you could tell me what this is. You can see a dime next to it. 
That's a good guess. That's a good guess. So, I, so this is a hem weight, and a hem weight, H-E-M. It would have been sewn into a, a woman's garment to keep the hems from, I guess, moving up too much or something. <laughs> and this one here, I wonder if any. <laughs> so that's about, you can see that's over six inches long. I was digging somewhere, and this came out very almost threateningly and menacingly out of the ground, the hand. And I was, I was not. I was stumped as to what this might be, and that's a that's a great that's a great guess. And uh, someone I met on the the ground at the time said maybe it's some kind of funerary ornament, like maybe it was on a casket or something or, or whatever. Um, so is it life size? I mean, it looks well. It's about it's like I say I wouldn't say life size, but it's like I say it's over six inches. Um, anyway, it. it it ends up not being something that, uh, it's not a piece of the Statue of Liberty or anything, you know, that Auguste Rodin might have dropped. But I, I did have to search quite a while to figure out what this was. And that's, as I said, that's kind of part of the fun. And I discovered, well, not so old and not so uh, unique. They, they were quite popular to have a hand-shaped spring-loaded holder that would hold maybe your cards or pieces of paper on your desk. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're larger. There are even ones that are kind of on a tree that would hang, probably people could hang their cards, but they all have this hand motif. So, but I, I, I still love the, the, that's, I always refer to it as the hand of fate. I, I think. And just a couple of other loose odds and ends, nothing particularly remarkable, but just the kinds of things I find. And I'm just curious if any of you um, have any thoughts. Um, I mean, I have a quick, sorry? Napkin holder. <laughs> uh, well, that, that would be a good guess. I mean, I don't think this one is 100%, anybody's 100% sure, but the current theory amongst metal detectorists is that they are parasol slips, oh. that they were part of the structure of parasol. But I find them quite frequently, so I don't know. I guess parasols were, were a thing. Uh, how deep are you finding these things? How much are you digging? Um, I would say 90% of this stuff is one foot or less. I'm not going to really hear something lower than one foot unless it's very large, like a horseshoe or a pipe. Um, um, but sort of when that, and I have found in, in, a, in a yard, you know, a, a neighboring yard, it was a matter of just a few inches. I found three, another pocket spill of three. 18th century coins altogether, just a few inches below the ground. Um, I don't know if they move up and down much with the freezing and thawing, but uh, sometimes they've been quite close to the surface. Uh, any ideas what that might be? Yeah, I, 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 think, that, I think the gentleman over there is probably more, and I'm not saying I'm certain about this, but my current thinking is that this is a, a trigger guard from an early probably an early rifle. It's made out of brass, so that would probably fit with, with the um, materials they would do that from at the time. I have no answer for this one. I found this. I have no idea what it is. It's a, again, these are half-inch grids, so it's probably about four inches or so tall. If anybody has an idea, I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to learn what this is. It's also, it seems like it was attached at the bottom. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to give you a full. A piece of furniture or something. Yeah, it's just that funny shape up top that uh, is, has me puzzled. But I'm, I really am just tossing that out there. I have no clue uh, what that is. And this is another one. Why this was in a field, I don't know. Is it part of a tool? I have a wacky theory that this might be the tip of a lightning rod, but I really don't know. And again, it's just. Uh, is it hollow? Yeah, it is hollow. There is no remnants of anything inside. It looks like a preserved carrot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a carrot uh, preserver. I don't know. So, so that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.